Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Hello, hello. Thank you again for joining us, listeners. I have a great topic for you today. With me is Dr. George Ackerman. He is a Parkinson's disease advocate. We're going to talk a lot about Parkinson's disease, um, but he does some other things as well. So without further ado, let's welcome George and have him talk about his his journey into becoming a um, Parkinson's disease advocate. So thanks, George, for joining us. Thanks. Thanks for you and to your audience, because it means the world to me and my family to have an opportunity to speak today. And uh, I was really excited, looking forward to it. And I, uh, one of my favorite things is your background and the flowers, because it makes me, <laughs> even during tough times and these talks, it still makes me give a little bit of a smile. But unfortunately, my mother passed on 1 1 2020 due to Parkinson's. And, uh, you know, when she, uh, she had it for about 15 years, but the last four is when she really needed me. And I always say uh, she sacrificed a lot of her life when I was a child. She was a school teacher and a master's degree and kind of gave it all up to raise me and my brother and i knew when she needed me i needed to be there and i wouldn't be the man i am today if it wasn't for her sacrifices mm, i think most of us feel that way about our moms or probably should um so i looked it up because i wanted to make sure that i was correct parkinson's disease is the third leading cause of dementia which as i mentioned before we were recording i don't think most people are aware of that is that something that you've also discovered in your talks and your advocacy no, they don't talk much about it. The sad thing is that uh, because there's no cure, is it's literally is because there's so many different uh, variations of Parkinson's to each individual. So what occurred to my mother in our journey doesn't mean, you know, it'll happen to someone else. She had late onset dementia, which brought the delusions and hallucinations, which were really terrifying. Not every person, though, with Parkinson's will get that. And as far as I'm aware, uh, Parkinson's, unfortunately, is the fastest growing neurodegenerative disease in the world. So it's not even just uh, the U.S. You know, it doesn't discriminate. It reaches uh, around everywhere. I mean, two years ago, I decided it's not just about my mother and I, uh, me anymore. It was about everybody. And I feel like like you were a family in this fight for all diseases, not just Parkinson's. It just happened that dementia and Parkinson's touched our, our family but I uh, was shocked to find out there's about 10 million people around the world that have Parkinson's and diagnosed. So I decided to interview 600 people from Africa to India to England, France, Spain, Iceland, and shocking, even Nova Scotia. So it just shows that it really, again, and sadly, it affects everybody. This uh, possibly not exactly the same, but a lot of the same types of uh, symptoms. So thank God for Zoom, huh? I mean, that's a, it's a good thing and a bad thing. And I'm actually writing a follow-up book about social media and how uh, I, it wasn't always easy because there's some crazy people out there. So, you, you know, never let I, my lesson was and to, my lesson here, for if anyone wants to know is never let a person, even if it's a stranger or someone, you know, ever thwart or prevent you from doing what you feel in your heart is right. And, uh, you know, I've had some interesting uh, scenarios in my Facebook groups and things where, you know, you're supposed to have First Amendment in the U.S., but not on Facebook. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that'll be in the future. But, you know, like, like I said, it's not easy to reach everyone. Some days I'm still kind of, whether it was caregiving and now as an advocate, detrimental to my own health, because I just feel like even meeting today, if we reach one person, we'll change the world. Well, there's a certain point where I want to reach everyone, and I, you know, it's not normally po like not physically or mentally possible and i uh and i need to kind of cut back but then every time i see someone struggling it makes me kind of forget my own you know stress or feeling like i'm tired and to keep fighting till we find a cure so only about 10 million people worldwide have parkinson's that's that's pales in comparison to alzheimer's which is and that's a big uh, that's a big thing is there is more attention unfortunately at all times because more people are affected but that doesn't mean we should you know forget or leave out those who are also suffering from Parkinson's and I did a live event a few weeks ago for the Michael J Fox Foundation an IQ event the community event and you know like we said virtual is amazing because I met I get to be with incredible people like you and your audience but being there 
physically, like right in front of people who unfortunately are suffering and the families is just uh, not just inspiring, but life changing because there are people who like actually came by our table and I mean, somewhere in, you know, wheelchairs, one had a, a wheelchair I've never seen, which was like a standing wheelchair. It was interesting, but sadly she kind of, one of the symptoms of Parkinson's is you, you're, it's almost like you just freeze, like you just can't move because it's a movement disorder. And she was in front of my table and kind of frozen. So I went over and hugged her and just wanted her to know she has our support, but it's not something that is, uh, you know, people have to leave their careers. Many are scared to tell their own family, their jobs, and it's unfortunately, you know, crippling disease and, uh, and slow progression for some, but fast, like in my case, for my mother. Does Parkinson's ha hit people younger on average than Alzheimer's? I know it seems like younger onset Alzheimer's, which is basically what my mom had, but she wasn't diagnosed early enough in the disease to be classified that way. Um, does it, cause I know like, I'm a child of the eighties. Michael J. Fox was my guy from, you know, yeah. family ties to back to the future <laughs> and all the movies. And, um, if you haven't, I think you have seen it, but the, for the listeners, if you have not had the opportunity to watch Apple's special called, you are going to remember the name of the movie. I'm so terrible with names. It's the Michael J. Fox movie that Apple did on Apple TV. I had the honor to meet him a month or two ago, and it was uh, just an incredible experience. But it was almost like the my life flash of before me because I was so excited. But at the same time, I was so sad because I saw what the disease uh, was doing to him. Uh, yeah, so the name of the movie. Really... Sorry. Yeah. The name of the movie was Still. I was thinking yeah, Still, still I... Me, but it's just Still. I just found it. I was looking at it, but uh, <laughs> I saw it. I loved it. And I usually don't look at comments, but. I did notice people were literally saying now they're aware and that's really what why he's a hero of mine because he could have chosen like many which is nothing wrong with it who want to be private to kind of just you know not fade away but do their own thing instead he has raised over two billion not million two billion dollars for research and you know the thing that stinks in my view to speak for plain English is he's still you know not uh, doing too well even though they've raised two billion. A few weeks ago, he had to be brought out on a wheelchair uh, when he won a big award. So, you know, and he stood up, which was amazing. So he's a fighter. That's He inspires me to keep fighting. And I was really honored when I gave him one of the, we have a band we give out for free, just as in memory of my mother and her Parkinson's. And he actually put it on, was wearing it. And he now knows about my mother. He knows about our journey. And we told him, you know, we raised over, ten thousand dollars over the last few years for the michael j fox foundation we're still donating and uh you know he knows that we're out there also fighting and we're really again i don't want to sound like a broke record but a family in this fight because if we don't that's why i want to come on your show to bring light to parkinson because if we don't have everyone aboard this ship we're going to be further from a cure so it's very important to reach people not just inside the parkinson's community but also outside we definitely need more awareness so that people know how to interact with caregivers like us, you know, family members like your mom, my mom, et cetera. But um, I, I derailed our my question, which I'm really good at doing. Um, Michael J. Fox got Parkinson's really oh, yeah. young. Does Parkinson's generally hit people in the young, like in their 40s? Or is it that is just... A... There's a real misconception that it used to, it's like the elderly man disease, which is not true. Now we're actually trying to do more research and shed more light on females with Parkinson's because there's not enough out there for that. But it, there is something called early onset, and he had it in his 30s. And I actually heard a story, which you could check if it's true, but that a baby was born with it in another country. So, uh, yes, they do have science that shows uh, anyone can get it any age. I don't know if I'll get it. They don't think it's genetics. They do think it's environment, and I completely agree. My mother had a nice home for 20 years in South Florida, but it had mold. It had uh, termites, and, you know, we took care of it, but who knows what the heck they were spraying. And uh, I interviewed an expert in the, the area of motor movement disorders and Parkinson's, and he even told me, which I was shocked, that uh, the – sprays the chemicals on the dry cleaning could cause it and I, I i actually was speaking to him and i want to take my suit off while we were talking and throw it <laughs> out uh, so and also the fruits that we buy and pesticides so there's a lot of unfortunate 
things out there that can cause, we believe, Parkinson, but there's no 100% science. Well, that's kind of why I like talking to people that aren't all, always Alzheimer's caregivers, yeah. because I firmly believe, one, I say this a lot on the show, not really sure modern life is good for our brains. And you just listed a few modern things like dry cleaning. Yay for me for being cheap and not, not ever buying clothes that need dry cleaning. <laughs> I stopped going, but then I started doing all these shows, and now I have to so I'm spending a ton of it on this. <laughs> we need green screen clothes. <laughs> Right. Yeah, that was, we can come up with it. <laughs> um, but then you know, there's got to be a connection that they're not, they're get, they're missing, and maybe it's because you've got the group studying Parkinson's, you got the group yeah. doing Alzheimer's, and people doing vascular, and they all need to get in the same room and put their <laughs> their big science brains together, and and I sometimes think they need to take a big step back and go, are we on the right track? Yeah. You know, because we finally, in the Alzheimer's community, we we quote unquote have treatments. You know, it's remains to be seen how good they are, but they're better than nothing at this point. And one thing leads to another. So hopefully the Parkinson's community can get caught up. Um, is there good, an ass- you, one was good that? thing? Is, uh, last December, I think we spoke around then, but they finally passed to the House, the United States House of Representatives, the first ever. Uh, national plan to end Parkinson disease, and it's literally mirrored from the Alzheimer's bill. But we've never, shockingly and sadly, we've never had anything ever in the history of the United States, which is really kind of sickening if you, if I say it out loud. But uh, that we've never had anything. So this will actually bring more. Uh, this will be the first time this federal funding, if it passes, for Parkinson's research for caregivers for those diagnosed. I wish they would add a section for people like me, if we have time, but, uh, you know, there's people who I'm not diagnosed. I'm not a caregiver of someone alive, but I'm still, you know, grieving even four years later. And there's a lot of lack of uh, support still in my experience for people who lost a loved one due to Parkinson's. And we have like probably 20, 30 million people, unfortunately. And a lot of time I think, and I'm just saying from my experience that most people, they lose their loved one. They, even with Alzheimer's, they might just move on and go back to life they don't realize that they still have a say their their loved one still matters and their voice still counts so that's a new shift i'm actually looking into and we added a section on together for sharon.com called in memory where i share interviews and journeys of people who are family members who lost someone from parkinson's now when i did the ones with advocates at 600 and there were thousands of people but now it's much more complicated and difficult but i've been able to find 10 or 11 I'm hoping to do that the rest of my life, but I want people out there who did lose a loved one to from due to Parkinson's or related to know that they're never going to be forgotten. And I'll keep fighting too to find a cure for those uh, diagnosed and their families today, but in memory of all those unfortunate who didn't have a chance and lost their battle. I understand that because so you lost your mom January 1st, 2020. My mom passed away March 31st, 2020. And, you know, our family was blessed with nobody lost a job, nobody lost a home, you know, yeah, life was different, a little frustrating, a little, little bit limiting, but I'd, I'd worked from home since 2005, so my life didn't change that much. So I kind, and I felt so blessed that I didn't have to try you know, window visits or Zoom calls with my mom or, you know, all of the things that people did to keep connected to their loved ones during that insane time. But I don't think, you know, I I think it actually drug out the whole grieving process. I feel like it's always there in the background. It's kind of weird. Um, I, I harass my friends at the Alzheimer's Association because two years after my mom died, they implemented um, bereavement support groups, which you can do for two years. I'm like, oh, thanks. So you automatically <laughs> kicked me out of the group before you even started. Um, and I think that's really good. But I'm also a support group facilitator. And there's been talk about, well, do we want to like insist that somebody move into the bereavement support groups so that the the active support groups can maintain 
what they're doing, but they're known in this group. It's like a whole thing. It's like, oh my goodness. It's just so much support needed. And one of my big talking points is and until corporate America realizes that these diseases, especially Alzheimer's, but when you add them all together, you know, there's, I just learned there's like 80 million Americans that are part of the sandwich generation. So I was just barely past that when my mom, when my dad died and we had to start taking care of my mom. Uh, my sister was still sandwiched, but it's like, that's a lot of adults. Yeah. And it, it's affecting our economy. It's affecting the bottom line of corporations. And so it's my goal now to help train HR people to how to support people like us so that we can continue working and taking care of families and all of the things that we have to do until we can find a cure. So I'm assuming you still worked while you're, while you were caring for your mom, because you're not that old. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I still work even day and night now, but I have three children. Thankfully my wife was my biggest support without her. Even today I would not make it probably because I, I could probably read a sentence later if we have time from the book that just we published, but and it's great that I have it because we never have the time that I like to, but it takes inside the good, the bad, and the ugly of a caregiver. And again, it's not, I don't think you could take a course. I was just thrown in like with the wolves, almost like when you're first going into policing in the street from the academy or when you're becoming a lawyer into court from the law school, you don't really learn what you need to until you're out there. And uh, that was uh, something that, you know, it's not easy even to talk about. A lot. I mean, I went through, you know, sadness, depression, anger, not at my mother, but at the disease. I mean, my mother was the sweetest, nicest human being I've ever met. She even uh, took a light once and threw it in the wall because she was mad at Parkinson's and the doctors. We went to 15, just, you know, there's no cure. So it was very, very calm. We went to experts too, and not much you could do. You could try and control the tremors, which was one of the big signs of Parkinson's. Uh, some people she had internal, but Michael J. Fox has external tremors. Also dystonia with the curling of the toes, and she had rigidity and very bad stiffness, so she couldn't even use uh, one arm for towards the end. But uh, so those were just some of the symptoms. Plus, all the medicine destroyed her stomach, so that was another world of issues. And as a male caregiver, it was complicated because I can't, you know, go into the bathroom with my mother. I didn't want to. I wanted her to have privacy and still feel like a human being. So we had to hire staff almost, and we paid like 12000 a month just for full-time 24-7 care. She's made me swear, which I'm glad to say that we never put her in a home, but there were days where even though I swore to her, I was going to tell my wife I'm going to go look at homes because not because I didn't want to help, but I couldn't, I'm not trained for any of this. And not only the Parkinson's, like we mentioned, then the dementia started and it was just every, I felt like a nail and like every day the hammer just kept hitting me and hitting me and it was not easy. And then we shift now to advocacy and same type of thing. Obviously it's even worse because I miss my mother 24 seven, but even the cover of the book, if you see it behind me, it's a, uh, it's my favorite picture of my mother and I, it was uh, the dance, the son and uh, mother and son dance at my wedding. And that was like my favorite day of my life, except when my children were born. But in that moment, those three minutes, like Parkinson didn't matter. It didn't exist. And it'll never take that, you know, memory. So even looking at the cover sometimes for me is not easy. And uh, I mean, I, I'm 6'2", 200 pounds law enforcement and a big and tough, but I'm a mama's boy. And one day I was done with a meeting, went in the other room and I fell apart. And my wife was thankfully there to sweep me back up. But it's, you know, this stuff is not easy, but I think it has to be discussed because we're only going to end these type, all diseases if people like us and your audience share it. And please support uh, your show and share it, share it, share it, because none of us are here for money. We're here to help people. And every time I see and every time I want to give up, because we were mentioning I'm having a third back surgery, unfortunately, every day I wake up and I'm in pain, I try to think about my pain. But then literally in a second, I think of all those still struggling, which is much worse to me with Parkinson's who have to lose their jobs, their family, everything. And I get right back up and I keep fighting. So. Well, thank you for that. That's definitely not easy. You um, said something a few minutes ago that struck me. Um, the one thing that I find really challenging with caregiving, it seems like all of us have to start 
at square one and recreate the wheel for ourselves and our loved one. And you said, you know, when, cause you've, you're a lawyer and you're in law enforcement, um, when you leave the police academy, you get kind of tossed on the street to learn, but at least you have a training officer there to mm -hmm. help you, to give you the look when you're going the wrong direction. You're not recreating the wheel of being a, a rookie cop. And I would assume the same thing in, in a courtroom. Thankfully, I don't have too much experience with either of those professions. I always joke and say, I, could have, I can arrest you, I can defend you, and then I can teach you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, so I think that's one of the reasons I keep doing this show. I keep learning yeah, like things course. I truly wish I'd known like, 10 years ago when you know my dad had health issues that he didn't handle very well. And then dealing with his health issues on top of my mom's Alzheimer's and he, he had the patience of a gnat, which didn't help anybody. <laughs> you know, it's just, it would have been nice if there was something that the doctors or a medical social worker or somebody could have said, okay, you know, Jennifer's dad, this is okay. Well, now we know for sure your wife has Alzheimer's. So here's some things you need to start doing. Here's, mm -hmm. here's the direction to go. No, it's just like they shrug their shoulders and be like, okay, best of luck, which just yeah, makes me what, nuts. That's why I started to go to the shrine.com. I was really felt alone. My mother felt alone. We were lost. So I wanted to build something completely free, not for me. It was, it's been a huge investment, but it's worth it. pays off for me just feeling grieving because that helps me too. But uh, uh, we put like everything on the website from the 600 interviews that I've done around the world to uh, my journey, my mother, as you can get the book if you're interested there. We also now have a newsletter. We started a section in memory for people who have lost a loved one. We have a section, it's called PWP, People with Parkinson's, who I put websites of people uh, to try to help them raise money to pay their own medicine. Because I love the big organization, but a lot of time the little guy and the girl don't really, you know, get something from the big organ. No offense, that's just reality. So I wanted them, like an artist who has Parkinson's, a guy who I've become family with who makes mugs for and T-shirts for Parkinson's. So anything that goes to them, it goes to them. It doesn't touch me at all. We don't want anything. We don't accept money. Uh, also, we have a, a section now, which I'm really proud of. It has, I've been adding anyone who is an author with Parkinson's or on the Parkinson's topic. There's a whole listing of books and how you can purchase. It's amazing. So Everything's just growing and growing. It's kind of out of my control now. It's just getting bigger. I always said if three or four people see the site, I'll be happy. But there's a little counter that's hidden in the front, which you could see. And we've had almost 40,000 people visit the site. So I don't know if that's because of my work or, unfortunately, is it because Parkinson's is growing? And I hope it's not because of that. So I have one little passage from the book if you want. I can. Yeah, uh, definitely. Kind of fits in. I've never done this before. I didn't have the book last time, but this is uh, you know about caregiving, but it starts off the ultimate challenge. My life was difficult to manage between my mother, family, and work. Initially, before caregiving, I felt like I was juggling a few small tasks, but when I assumed the primary caregiver role, I held an entire universe on my shoulders. So that's uh, just a quick thing because I don't want to take too much time, but that's really how I felt. I felt like, you know, that famous Zeuser where he's a guy and he's holding the world. And it just, you know, I felt like every day it was just something else. And like I said, I would do it all again. I have no regrets except that we don't have a cure. But, you know, I was brought up to be very reliable and strategic. So I wrote like a list of things to do. We literally tried everything and just nothing, unfortunately, uh, worked. So, you know, that's my only sadness out of it all. Well, hopefully they'll get caught up to the Alzheimer's group. I mean, they discovered Alzheimer's disease like a hundred years ago. So <laughs> hopefully you guys are a little faster on the on the treatments. Um, and they don't so they don't know what causes it. They don't have a treatment. This sounds real familiar. Um, <laughs> the only thing they do have breakthrough is actually last year, and uh, it's called a biomarker. And now I wouldn't do it because I'm already getting needles, but they put a giant needle in your spine. And I believe they're able to determine if you have it, which is very important because now you can treat it. Otherwise, if people are getting misdiagnosed, late diagnosed, wrong diagnosed, that doesn't help. It's horrible. So that's huge. But what they really want to do in the next few years is take that giant spine pill, a uh, uh, needle, and turn it into a simple little regular blood test like you and have it at every doctor's office. Uh, obviously, it's still not a cure, but guess what? We can 
now we've learned that 45 minutes of exercise a day for everybody, even if it's not a Selma Park, could really slow the progression. Uh, dancing, boxing, rock steady boxing, uh, ballet. I mean, it's just incredible. There is a lot out there. So again, uh, together for Sharon, we list all the different resources from around the world. And the, the, my goal is that people know, even doing the show today, that they're never alone in this fight. And there's people out there who do send our love and support and we want nothing in return. We even have a section for donations. And if you look closely, all it is is five big organizations like Michael J. Fox Foundation and Drive Toward a Cure. They're actually, those organizations were nice enough to make a link and it's in memory of my mother, but all donations go to those organizations. We do not accept a dime or a penny even. So I just want, again, my biggest thing is that I don't want any money. Anyone who sees us, just again, know that you're never alone. Well, that's what, one of the reasons I chose podcasting as a method of sharing stories and advice and all this good stuff, because you can listen to it whenever you need. I've got over oh. 300 episodes. Mm -hmm. You have to kind of dig around for some of the some of them because yeah. my hosting platform only shows 300 at a time, although right now it seems like it's 295, which is plenty. <laughs> that's almost a yeah. whole year's worth of listening. If you listen to one a day, you're, you're good, but they're there. Um, but you were talking about rock steady. So I had a neighbor before I moved up to the Sierra foothills of California. One of my neighbors had Parkinson's and I still worry a little bit about them because he was probably six, five and his wife was like maybe five foot, maybe, <laughs> maybe if she was wearing heels, she was a tiny lady. <laughs> and he always said, you know, he didn't want to be a burden on her. And it was like, oh yeah, yeah. That sounds like my mother. But he um, gave up being a Rotarian, which was, a very, very important part of his life because in our town, the only time he could do the rock steady boxing for the Parkinson's was the same time as our Rotary Club meeting. So he he reluctantly left for his health. And then he also had the the brain implant to slow down the uh, tremors. DB, uh, DBS surgery. Yeah, yeah it brain. did help. Um, I haven't seen them. I'll have to Ask my husband. He goes down there more often than I do. So see how they're doing. Because it's been a long time that he's had it. He was a veterinarian. So, you know, I don't know what uh, environmental things he might have been exposed to. We lived in a farming community where, you know, they had the crop dusting. Um, so that was always fun to try to avoid. So, again, I'm not sure modern life is great for our brains. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to figure out how to navigate modern life. Well, I think there's some things we need to just stop doing, but that's that's a whole other topic. <laughs> um, so the one thing I wanted to ask you before we get too, too far close to the end is, so did you stop working to take care of your mom? No, I wasn't able to because I'm a professor, so I teach around the country. And I just, you know, the nice thing is I was able to kind of be flexible when you're a professor. And uh, so I did sacrifice a lot of my own health. But again, because I, I used to love to you know work out, exercise myself. My favorite thing was Sundays. I would play basketball. I had a group of like fifty guys, and I'm getting older, so I had to, it took me a half hour to get ready because you have to put a million things on your ankles. I broke in every ankle, and I remember one morning it's in the book that I was all ready to go and at least get an hour break of life. And unfortunately, my mother's you know dementia kicked in, and she would call me twenty four seven saying the people there are harming her. Uh, somebody's going to, like, she's very scared. And I, I knew if I was there with her, she would felt safe. So I would drop everything and just rush over. And I'm glad I did it. But again, that goes against the number one rule, take care of yourself first. But I, again, I didn't, you know, we were told you don't die of Parkinson's, you die with it. My mother was only 69. She had no other medical issues at all. So I w we, we were kind of still in shock that she passed due to it because whether it was because of Parkinson's or the other medicines. I mean, when she passed away, I had a uh, tough time was cleaning out our home, which I'm sure it's hard for everyone. But she had like five huge contractor-sized black bags, garbage bags of medicines. And I, I feel that, you know, that could have caused, obviously, uh, speeding up the problem rather than reducing it. So, that, you know, so anyway, that was the tougher part of the caregiving world. But... Like I said, I wouldn't trade it for the world because if I could just have my mother uh, be a little, feel a little safe, then that's all I want to do. And I had an, I have an incredible wife because towards the last year, my mother was was 
kind of getting so thin, like so thin that it wasn't even recognizable and it felt horrible for her. And she still wanted to be a woman and be like a person and not let the disease take over everything. So my wife brought in like a pedicure, manicure, hair done and all different beautiful things. And some days it was tough. She was too sick, but she loved it when she was able to have it. She also loved when her three grandkids came over because they were really small, but we had one room dedicated where they can des destroy it. <laughs> it was like the kids <laughs> playroom and she would sit there and she would, you know, a lot of times she would shake and things, but she always was happy when they were screaming and playing and she loved to blow bubbles in the backyard with them on Sundays. And now where I live, we actually bought a bigger home because she was going to move in with us. And so it's tough to even live here, to be honest, because I walk by the room that should have been hers. I walk by the backyard that she should be out there. And I feel that Parkinson's took 15 years of her life alive and 15 years uh, afterwards. So that's, uh, you know, it's heartbreaking, but I'm inspired by people like you and people I meet. And I still, like you said, learn something new every day, even from our uh, talk today. I'm not like a lot of people who think because I have three master's degrees, a law degree, the PhD, and the <laughs> police that I have. I still have a lot to learn. And every day to me is still a learning experience. Ah, you make me sound like a dummy. <laughs> I have like one degree. <laughs> more than enough. You're not supposed to have more than one. <laughs> I had other. I had planned to go, you know, like uh, into federal law enforcement. So it always a plan, but I'm glad I, I kind of fell in love with education and my career before caregiving or my life was uh, aiding African American mothers who lost their loved one due to a crime in West Palm Beach, Florida, murder. Uh, a lot of time, unfortunately, I'm sure even if you just everyone out there watch the TV, unfortunately, you'll have a victim, but then the family members become secondary victims. And a lot of time, they're forgotten by the criminal justice system. And I kind of correlate that to the Parkinson's community, because as we said earlier, they've been forgotten by our government, our political system, and uh, even awareness. So now we're finally shedding some light on it. But, uh, you know, it's very important to keep fighting. Well, the reason I asked if you had the ability to stop working, which you didn't, you had flexibility, which is necessary. If you'd gone into federal law enforcement, you wouldn't have had that flexibility. Right. So I'm assuming you would either have had to not care for your mom the way you did, or you would have had to quit that job. Yeah. So what would you like, or how do you think employers should be con considering, let's see, how do I want to word this? How should employers be supporting family caregivers so that one, you can continue doing the things that need to be done to live, like pay bills and buy medicine for your mom and things for the kids, but it, but also to keep the institutional knowledge, the, um, you know, a highly motivated employee, because if you're supporting them, you know, they're going to be, if, unless they're very strange people, they're going to be super grateful and probably double down on what they can offer the corporation. So what, what kind of things do you think we should like, we're advocating for awareness, but I think this kind of awareness also stretches into like, if we don't fix and support family caregivers much better, we're going to spiral into a really bad economic place that I don't want to live in. Thank you. <laughs> you know, we got people that have to leave work early or leave work entirely, which reduces the amount of money they have to live or reduces the amount of money they have for retirement you know, which then puts the burden on the next generation and then maybe they're leaving work early. So you can see this is a very bad snowball effect that we really should avoid. So my question back to you is, what do you think employers could and should do to help support their employee family caregivers? I mean, that's a good question. Uh, I teach business law and I HR management. So it's a oh, perfect question for you. <laughs> I mean, there, we have laws out there like, a, uh, you know, Medical Leave Act of FMLA. We have uh, ADA laws of equal uh, protection. So many laws of EEOC and you know, how many of them are really upheld. That's another accountability is important. But problem is, you, I don't know if you can really regulate private versus public type companies. Uh, probably public, you can more private. You know, they do what they want to do with their private company. I think it's important even just to have a little training, maybe yearly. I know in my 
a lot of jobs I work were required to take, you know, sexual harassment training, uh, ADA training. Every week there's a new training, and it's I don't even really teach anymore. It's always training, training. So they can definitely implement something which would show uh, a lot of support. I actually am targeting the emergency management world. I'm going to work on a book soon about policing and Parkinson because I actually taught at the academy. And it's ironic, and I don't like talking a lot about it because I don't want to ruin. They'll go and put it in, and then they don't have a book. <laughs> but uh, so right now, when you read the academy, there's only like 10 minutes at all for all these diseases. But it literally says, and I have it in the next room, uh, elderly, and it says Alzheimer's and uh, dementia. But there's nothing. The word Parkinson doesn't exist. So I really want to write a book on that. And Michael J. Fox Foundation said hopefully they'll still be able to at that time. They would help me try to sponsor a bill through Congress throughout the United States. So to have uh, every police department in the United States implement the word Parkinson into their training. And this isn't just police. It needs to go for fire, for nursing, for everything so that we have uh, something out there. Because uh, in law enforcement, as many of your viewers know, unfortunately, bad things can happen if uh, officers are trained. Well, I've heard horror stories where someone has external tremors and they're shaking uncontrollably. And let's say they're driving at midnight or it's 11 at late at night, it's dark. They get pulled over. I don't want that officer to think they're, you know, drunk or drive DUI or maybe they, uh, you know, are, are drugged. And that's not it. They have Parkinson's. And in that one second moment of interaction could end very badly. So mm -hmm. not that really goes to the core of what you're saying because. A police department, even though we don't think of it, is also in a way a business and has to has to stand in operating procedures, chain of command. So, you know, we need more of these organizations to put literally just the word Parkinson. That could be a great way to start and also the caregiver. So right now it doesn't exist at all. So anything uh, might be better than nothing. We introduced, and I say we, as Alzheimer's Association, really pressed for a bill in California last year that would have given... I know it was police. I don't remember if it included firefighters. And it was endorsed by most of the police associations in the state, like 13 of them. I don't know how many we have. We have a lot of people in this state. So, <laughs> um, And it it wasn't an expensive bill. It was the first year, but it, it supported more training. And I'm you know, going out on a limb here, don't really think that police officers want to like, oh, let's spend more time in a classroom learning about dementia. Probably yeah. not priority on their list. So the fact that the police associations were behind this bill was um, heartwarming. Unfortunately, California's economy is either surplus or deficit. We had the way we fund our state has got to change. So because we're now having a deficit, which has been exasperated by the, you know, all the strikes in Hollywood and everything else that's been going on lately, um, you know, the bill didn't pass mostly because they were like, oh, we don't want to spend, I think it was like $13 million. It was not a whole lot of money. I mean, $13 million would certainly change my life, but that was kind of one of the things we were pointing out. And one of the state representatives that I spoke to actually had an elderly next door neighbor try to get into um, their house through the sliding glass door in the back. Now you can only imagine, here's a law, uh, you know, not a, what is it, a legislator, California state legislator, and here's this person trying to get in their house and our political environment right now is not, uh, not warm and fuzzy to say the least. I mean, bad things could have happened had this legislator, had she not been aware of what was going on with the neighbor. And so definitely awareness is crucial, you know, because like you said, you've got somebody with tremors, pull them over, you know, in the, the wee hours of the night. And, the, you know, they may not be able to comply as, as they are requested to do. But I'm sure the first thought is like, here's this, this guy is all shaky and twitchy. And I'm sure since you deal with you know, not always the best people, that your first instinct is not going to be Parkinson's. It's going to be some sort of drug. Safety. Yeah, or also safety. Safety for the officer yeah. and the person. And I can, I can see a back, not well, backlash might be a strong term, but a, a resistance because if you assume it's Parkinson's or maybe it's Alzheimer's and that's why they're not being compliant, now you've got your safety at risk also. So it's like, oh my goodness. So <laughs> I'm with you there on the advocacy. We need to, you know, 
we need people to understand, and I'm sure my audience fully understands this already, so spread the word, guys, um, is that these diseases touch everybody, whether you're aware of it or not. You know, maybe your next door neighbor is taking care of a family member long distance and they're stressed out and they're doing, maybe they're drinking a lot more than they should or they have to cut back on their work hours. So now they're not able to do things to keep their home up, which affects your property value. I mean, there's a lot of things that are less visible. And this is why I think, I'm not thinking corporations need to have a regulation. I would like to see HR departments have the training to recognize somebody that might be dealing with these kind of stresses that you and I have gone through, although I can't imagine how we would do that. Um, and just find ways to support the employee because it's going to help support the business's bottom line. We don't need the government involved in that. Let's just, let's just go cold, hard cash. I'm an entrepreneur. Cash <laughs> talks. It solves a lot of problems. You know, we already have a worker shortage and, you know, training and hiring are expensive. So I really think that the more awareness we have overall and in corporations, the better everybody's going to be. So that's kind of why I wanted to talk to you today, just to help, help further that cause on both sides of the, of the disease aisle there. Is there anything else? So you've, you've mentioned the website, which will be hot linked in the show notes and the book. I'll link that as well. Um, I'm assuming it's on Amazon or do I, you can just yeah. get it through your website too. Yeah. Um, and then, Actually, oh, no, we actually just the ebooks uh, out. The ebook, the I know I'm, I'm a first time uh, in this area of publishing a book was not easy. It was easier to write the book than to get it online. <laughs> but uh, we actually have an audio book coming soon, which will be it's somebody else's voice, like an exciting person, not my voice. But I uh, thought it'd be nice to just offer it. But we're not we're not looking for the. It's really I want this out there really for advocacy and so people know our journey, but. It really is a good book, too, to help people not just cope, but understand what might be uh, possibly what happened in our scenario. doesn't mean it'll happen to them, but it's a lot of positive. So I always say there's a lot of light in the tunnel, even though it came from some tough times. So a lot of good in it. Uh, my, my, my wife's actually going to interview me about the book on a podcast coming soon, so that'll <laughs> be fun. But I do have one last statement I usually say, uh, and it's uh, this is going to see you and your audience, too. We love you. We support you. We care a lot about you, and you're never alone. I, will, along with Jennifer, will advocate for you, and together our voices are so much stronger. And I'm just getting started. And I only say that, obviously, because I've been doing it for a little time, but every day, like I said, I wake up and I see another one of those journeys that inspire me on my website, or maybe that someone, you know, the only journey that breaks my heart is the one I'm not aware of. And there are still so many people out there. I've just got, while we're talking, a text that somebody, a very famous race car driver, lost somebody from Parkinson. And she's going to come on. We have a podcast now, too. I never wanted a podcast. I didn't want a website. I wish I had my mother, but this again helps me cope. It helps me uh, grieve. And I think it in, uh, inspires some hope that you're never alone. So I just want to thank you and your audience today. And this is not just about a, you know, a kind of quick talk and then bye bye. I never see you again. I hope I consider you like family and your audience. We're not a foundation. We don't want money. It's just me and one son, one person who lost his best friend and mother. And it really breaks my heart every day. But knowing people like you and your audience are out there really uh, just change. It's a game changer and inspires me again to just get up and keep fighting. So thank you and your audience again for the time it means the world. Well, you're welcome. And thank you for joining us. And, I know for those listening, you're still in the thick of things, most likely. It does change, as George and I can attest. And like he said, our voices amplified can make a change. So, you know, embrace your caregiver friend that might be dealing with a family member with Parkinson's. And the Parkinson's people can embrace us Alzheimer's people. And we'll get this fixed. We will. <laughs> Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.